Okay, let's get started. Uh, first off, an announcement. After this lecture, we're supposed to meet in the conservatory for our group photo. I'm not exactly sure where the photo is going to be taken, uh, but I have been told that we're supposed to meet there, and then we'll be told where to go for the, for the group photo. So this lecture is on the Austrian theory of the business cycle, and it's, it's sort of a, an interesting step that we're taking in the course of the week, because we're taking a step into the hampered market economy. So when we talk about the Austrian theory of the business cycle, we're referring to something that doesn't happen in an unhampered market economy, or at least it's not supposed to. So something, is, something outside of the market economy is, is acting that, that causes the boom-bust cycle to occur in the Austrian theory. So let's just quickly recap what we've learned about the unhampered market economy so that we can better contrast what happens in the, in the business cycle. So we've seen probably the best example is with, is with Crusoe. We, we've seen how Crusoe, alone on his island, he can economize. He sees the, the resources around him and he can allocate them towards productive uses based on his preferences and based on his ideas about how those resources can be combined in such a way to, to achieve the ends that he has. And if he wants so-called economic growth, if he wants an increase in his standard of living, more consumption goods, then what he needs to do is he needs to set aside consumption goods. So suppose he has coconuts and berries. He needs to set aside a certain stock of coconuts and berries to last him through the period of production where he would need to create some capital goods that would then allow him to create more consumption goods. So he might be in some state, in order for him to increase his wealth, he has to save first. He has to set aside real resources that he doesn't consume immediately. He, he sets them aside for a different purpose. And that purpose is to either sustain him through the production process or to accumulate res productive resources, factors of production that help him make the things that he needs to make more things that he wants. And so that's, we have a theory of economic, sustainable economic growth for Caruso that way. And it's not really much of a problem. I mean, it, it would be so, sort of difficult for Caruso surviving by himself but intellectually, it's not a problem because there's only one mind. There's only one person making these choices, so he can evaluate everything that's, that's around him and make, and make these choices on his own. It's, it's his ideas about how to combine factors of production. It's his preferences that he's trying to, to uh, attain, his satisfactions that he's trying to you know, get towards. So there's not really a problem. It is, it's a little bit more of a problem when we have more than one person in an economy. It's a little bit... It's a little bit more difficult because now we have two people with preferences, two people with ideas, or more than two people, and we have to come up with a way to allocate factors of production, allocate savings in such a way as to still economize. We, we still want to achieve our, our most highly valued ends. We want to get the most important stuff and forego the less important stuff, given our, our set of resources and the ideas that we have. And we've seen through the past two days lectures on the mechanics of the unhampered market economy, how, how that happens. So we have market prices. Entrepreneurs can engage in economic calculation. So this is how we know that resources are going to their highest value use. So we're going to see a breakdown of that. This is just one example of a breakdown of that system. Uh, and it's called the, the Austrian business cycle theory. So Crusoe is one example. Um, before I even get into any of, this, of the slides, Perhaps a good analogy for the business cycle with Crusoe is that suppose one morning Crusoe wakes up and he sees some colorful mushrooms outside of his den. And he, he partakes some of these mushrooms. And then later on in the day, you know, his eyes get big and the changing colors and he starts hallucinating. And, he, and he, he, he looks at his stockpile of coconuts and berries that he's, he's been working on and he hallucinates that it's just 100 times bigger than it actually is. He thinks he has way more saved resources than he actually has, and it's just the effect of these mushrooms, perhaps. So you, would, you, you might see how Crusoe, seeing this much larger set of saved resources, would now undertake different production processes. He would undertake longer production processes. He might build different capital goods, more specific capital goods, because he thinks he has a larger supply of, of saved resources than he actually has. So, you know, someday the, the, the effect of the mushrooms wear off and he realizes that he's made all of these mistakes in the past. He dedicated factors of production, or he created factors of production that aren't 
for lines of production that can't be completed. So he, he changed his plans based on this incorrect view of his saved resources, and, and he's realized that he's made a mistake and he's gonna have to do something about it. Now, now what should he do? Should he consume more mushrooms? Just pretend that there's not a problem? So that's at least one solution. That seems like a, a bad one, right? What he should do is he should, you know, make do with what he has. Make, make the, so he's gonna have to convert some of the specific capital goods that he created in that process for other purposes, for a shorter period of production for different lines than what he had uh, designed in his, you know, in his high in the, while he was hallucinating. Probably a more straightforward analogy comes from Mises with, a, with a, the master builder. So let's go through this. So Mises says in Human Action, the whole entrepreneurial class is, as it were, in the position of the master builder whose task it is to erect a building out of a limited supply of building materials. If this man overestimates the quantity of the available supply, he drafts a plan for the execution of which the means at his disposal are not sufficient. He oversizes the groundwork and the foundations and only discovers later in the progress of, of the construction that he lacks the material needed for the completion of the structure. It is obvious that our master builder's fault was not an overinvestment, but an inappropriate employment of the means at his disposal. So this is a great analogy because it works in a metaphorical sense. So we, we see in a business cycle, the class of entrepreneurs, they all make a similar kind of error, they, they all make errors at the same time, what Rothbard referred to as the cluster of errors. And so it, it works in a, in a metaphorical sense, applying this to the, to the business cycle, but it also works in a literal sense because we can actually see in some boom bust cycles, uh, we have many new uh, uh, construction projects undertaken where people are building new houses. And we literally run into the problem where we, we don't have enough materials to complete the projects that we've started. So this is, this is Mises' analogy. All right, so now let's get into the, to the meat here. Let's, let's get towards a, a definition of, of a business cycle. Um, definitions are good because they help us exclude other things that aren't the thing that we're trying to define. The Austrians are particularly good at doing that. So let's rule out some things. Let's, let's try to figure out what are some things that we might initially look at and say, and say that's a business cycle, but it's actually not. So one example uh, that business cycles are not is just typical business fluctuations. So we see in the workings of the market economy changes happening all the time. People, production changes, maybe due to a change in the level of natural resources, maybe to a change in, in technology that, that we can dream up. Consumption changes, people change their preferences for consumption goods all of the time. And so there's just change all throughout the, the market economy happening all the time. And this does not pose a particular problem. We've, we've seen how it's the entrepreneur who is tasked with anticipating these changes, bearing the uncertainty of, of, of the market, bearing the uncertainty of all of these changing, changes happening, and then profit or loss results. And since they're aiming towards profit, we would hope that they're, they're, they're arranging production in such a way that we, we do have consumer preferences being satisfied. So that's the entrepreneur's task is to satisfy consumer demands. So that's not what we mean by a business cycle. It's not just a localized sort of change in, in a market. What we mean by business cycle is a, it's, it's marked by a general boom and general bust. So it's not localized. It's not a, one particular change. It's, it's what we see in economic data like the following. And really what matters is just that you see the shape of the line. It's not necessarily what the of what we're actually looking, what we're looking at. But in the, in the top left, it's the S&P 500. In the top right, it's uh, the unemployment rate. In the bottom left, it's uh, gross output. And in the bottom right, it's the Case-Shiller um, home index, the home price index. So we see that there's this up and down. And it, it seems like things move up and then they move down for some sort of reason. We see wages go up and then they come down. We see capital goods prices uh, increase and then they come down. Employment goes up and then it goes down. And so this is what we're trying to explain. Oh, by the way, also the coming down is, is sort of painful. It seems like, you know, entrepreneurs are earning lots of losses. And so that's another thing that we need to explain in our business cycle theory. 
Another feature of, of the business cycle that we need to explain is, is the fact that capital goods uh, prices fluctuate more than uh, consumer goods prices. And this is noted by Rothbard. Probably the, the still the greatest exposition, exposition of Austrian business cycle theory is in Rothbard's America's uh, Great Depression in the first few chapters. So he says capital goods industries fluctuate more widely than do the consumer goods industries. Okay, so let's do some stock taking. What does this theory need to take into account? It needs to take into account the shape or the stages of the cycle. So there's a boom, and you can actually see that in these graphs. On the left, there's the uh, consumer price index, and on the right, it's the, the Fed zone. I, they probably don't measure it themselves, but they report it, the producer price index. So they're looking at the prices of capital goods. So there's the, the boom, there's an increase in price, there's an increase in uh, capital values, there's an increase in firm values, and then a, a sharp uh, decrease. It needs to take into account the, clush, the cluster of entrepreneurial errors that are all happening at the same time. So what could possibly be an explanation for everybody making the same sorts of mistakes at the same time? It needs to take into account the, the, fluctuate, the difference in the fluctuations in prices in the consumer goods industries and the capital goods industries. And right off the bat, we can look at some suspect areas. So we can look at money. And the reason that might be a good place to look is because money is a part of all transactions. So in money is called the widely accepted medium of exchange. And so everybody's doing transactions with money on one part of it. One side of every exchange is, is money. We can also look at credit since it also uh, pervades the economy. So we could look at those two areas as, as at least suspect areas where something might be going wrong and we can see you know, what's causing the boom and then the bust. Okay, so this is sort of a structure for the rest of the lecture. We need to cover these uh, bases. We need to recap structure of production, which Professor Rittenauer expertly uh, explained this morning. We need to recap time preference and interest. We can also do that quickly because of a great lecture by Professor Herbener. We need to look at sustainable growth or the mechanics of sustainable growth. Uh, we'll look at an example that's a little bit more complicated than Crusoe just saving more. And then we'll contrast that with unsustainable growth. We'll contrast that with the case where there's, it looks like there's an increase in production, it looks like there's economic growth that's happening, um, but it, it can't persist for some reason. And, and we'll get to that in the unsustainable growth part. And we'll see that the, the, the main culprits here, the, the key features of the boom period that cause it to turn into a bust is the malinvestment and overconsumption that happens during the boom. And so we'll single those two uh, key features out as we go. So first, structure of production. Instead of flourless chocolate cake, I'm gonna look at a ham sandwich. This is an exercise that I go through with my uh, uh, students on the first day of class, and usually there's lots of back and forth, but for the sake of time, I'm gonna do this sort of quickly. So what do we need to make a ham sandwich? You can imagine you need to, uh, or you want to purchase a ham sandwich from a deli, what are the sort of things that had that have to be there at the deli for you to enjoy the ham sandwich? And some of the things are very obvious. You need ham for a ham sandwich. Bread, lettuce, tomato, mayo, a plate, a table and chair to enjoy the ham sandwich on. The, the actual deli takes up space, takes up physical space, um, and so we call that land, the physical space that the deli takes up, and you need somebody there to put the elements together. And that's it, right? That's all, that's all we need to explain for where a ham sandwich comes from. Yeah, somebody's shaking, there's one person shaking their head, no. No, you're supposed to say no. There, we have to explain where all of these other things come from. And so the, the structure of production behind this particular consumer good, this ham sandwich is actually much more complex. So the ham might come from a butcher, the bread from a bakery, lettuce comes from farming, and so do tomatoes and the ingredients that go to mayonnaise. Who, who even knows what goes into mayonnaise? I guess there's eggs also go into mayonnaise, so we need a chicken farm. The paper mill helps us, uh, uh, or gives us materials to make paper plates. A furniture manufacturer makes the tables and chairs. Notice there are no further steps for land and labor, and the reason for that is because those are originary factors of production. So there's, we don't need to explain anything beyond or, or where we get land and labor from. Those, those are just sort of given to us. Um, we, we start off with those. The butcher requires land and labor, and a refrigerator and knives and all sorts of things. The bakery requires land and labor, an oven, flour, and this can just go on and on. 
At some point, we have big metal machines show up and there's a chicken and the egg problem. So we need big metal machines to refine the metals that give us the metals to help us make the big, big metal machines. So who even knows how that happened? But, so the, the, whole, the whole thing becomes really complicated and if you really take it to its conclusion, you get something that looks like this. <laughs> it's just this massively complex network of, of, of factors of production that are required to be combined in certain ways to, to get to the consumption good. Uh, if I look at my students' papers sometimes on the first day of class, sometimes it just looks like this. Like they just start, they just give up and it's just becoming too complicated. Okay, so this is not particularly helpful. Well, it's helpful for us to at least see the complexity of production, but it's not helpful if we want to uh, analyze what's going on here. And so one thing that the Austrian school has done is that they have taken this very complex structure of production and arranged it in a helpful pedagogical way. And the way that they've done that is with the, the structure of production of the Hayekian triangle. You've seen it there. Sometimes it's arranged vertically where you go from higher order goods to lower order goods, the lowest order good being the consumption good. Um, and so, man, this animation took a long time. I hope you appreciate it. So here's how we can take all of these features, all of these components of creating a ham sandwich and put them in time order. Yeah. So, so we, we start with um, natural resources. We start with uh, uh, research and development at the very beginning of the, of the stages of production. And then we, at the very end, we end up with the desired output, the ham sandwich. And we have the, the arrow indicates time. So time goes this way. So this is still a little bit cluttered, as you can see. And so what we can do is, since all of these elements in a market economy, all of these elements have market prices, we can tally up the, the expenditures on these factors of production in their various stages. And so that would look something like this. Well, first of all, this, this arrangement should look familiar to figure 32 from Rothbard's Man, Economy, and State. You have to turn your head sideways. Yeah, some people are doing that. But you could see that the factors of production, land, labor, and capital are arranged in a way where we end up with a consumption good at the end. So here's, here's where we stack up the spending in the various stages. So and on the left-hand side, we have spending in the first stage of production, and then we end up with total consumption spending on the right-hand side. It's the same thing. We're just, we've arranged all of the stages of production by time, and we've also added up the spending on, on factors of production, the cost of production at each stage. And one thing that we know is that in the ERE, once we take away all uncertainty about the future, the only remaining spread between stages is just interest. So we'll, we're going to see, in fact, on the very next slide, we're going to see a loanable funds market, but this is the, the, really the more important aspect of the, of the time market. It's the capital structure where capitalists are, are parting with present consumption today. They're parting with present resources today so they can't consume in, in hopes for in the future, they, they want revenue from the sale of their output, which means that they're making an intertemporal exchange, which means that they, they have to uh, reckon their time preferences in that process. And so the interest rate applies in the capital structure uh, just as much as it does in the loanable funds market, which we'll see here. So all that to say, the, all that to say production is interest rate sensitive. So pr production and the length of, of the production process um, has to do with our intertemporal uh, preferences, our time preferences. Okay, so let's take a closer look at time preference. So we prefer a given satisfaction sooner rather than later. However, there are different rates of time preference, which means that we can exchange. And in fact, you can put uh, all the people who have present money available to, to be lent to others, you can put them on a supply curve. And all the people who want present money today and are willing to pay a, a future uh, amount of money for the money that they get today, we can put them on the demand curve, including people who might borrow so that they can purchase factors of production and produce. So that's what happens in, in this loanable funds market as we, as we build out uh, Roger Garrison's uh, um, graphical exposition of the Austrian business cycle theory. So here's just one example of a trade that can happen between two people who have uh, different uh, rates of time preference. So 
the, the present money goes from Jeff over to David in exchange uh, David agrees to pay the future amount of $1,100 or a 10% interest rate um, over, over, whatever, over whatever the, the, the time period is. So if we have a bunch of people, then we can make a demand curve and a supply curve, and we see the equilibrium interest rate in this, in this loanable funds market. We're going to um, uh, take this loanable funds market and the, and the amount of borrowing that happens, the total amount of transactions that, that happens between sa uh, savers and, and borrowers, and we're going to allow that to correspond to the level of investment spending in a trade-off between investment spending and consumption spending. So in, in this top graph here, this might look familiar uh, to you if you've seen a production possibilities frontier. It's not exactly a production possibilities frontier because that shows two different uh, goods or two different factors of production that somebody might use to, to produce something. In this case, it's, it's just a trade-off between consumption and investment. And this should, this should make sense. So if we have a, a given set of resources, we can either use them for present consumption or future consumption. With a given set of resources, we can consume them today or we can set them aside and use them for future production. And that can either look like you know, plain saving where we just hold on to you know, some set of consumption goods that allow us to consume during a production process, or we actually have resources that are factors of production themselves that are, are productive. So that, that represents the, the investment side of things. So you can, you, can see how, <clears throat> you can see how this lines up with the loanable funds market in the bottom. And all you have to say is that all, all of the funds that are, are used for investment are subject to time preference. And some of that money is trading hands in the market for loanable funds. And some of it is, is, is entrepreneurs who are lending to themselves, but they still need an interest return. And so either way, we can line up so that the total level of investment spending in this economy is the same as the, the quantity of loans that are transacted in the, in the bottom graph, the loanable funds market. OK, so here's just one quick example. What happens if we have an increase in savings? If we have an increase in savings or a decrease in the rate of time preference, people will increase their supply of, of saved funds. So the supply of loanable funds increases. We, we just move down the demand curve. We have a new lower. Um, interest rate in this market. We have an increase in the quantity of loans that are transacted. And we can see how that corresponds. We, we move across the, the consumption and investment trade-off. So now we're consuming less and investing more. So these tell the same story. We're just looking at it for, in, in different ways. So in the bottom graph, we said there's an increase in the supply of loanable funds. Before that, we said there was a decrease in the rate of time preference. That's synonymous with saying we're going to consume less today. We're going to decide to consume less today and because we want to consume more in the future. So we, we do that sort of trade-off. <clears throat> the result of this is economic growth. We have more resources to consume and to invest in the future. So if we decide to dedicate more resources to production today, that means in the future we have additional resources. And so that real resource constraint as depicted by the bowed outward curve there, it expands outward. And really the only assumption that we have to make there is that the additional investment that we've made is net investment. It's, it's more than just what we need to replace or maintain our existing capital stock. So we have positive net investment. So we're adding to our capital stock. We're adding to our productive capabilities. We have um, economic growth. We have an increase in the, in the amount of resources that we can use for both consumption and investment. OK, so back to our starting point here. Let's add another component. Here we have our familiar Hayekian triangle. So before, I just had the, the dollar signs stacked up on top of each other. But here's it's, it's just sort of smoothed out here. Um, it's the structure of production. So we start with uh, land and labor, and we end up with consumption spending at the very end. So spending is depicted in the in the horizontal, excuse me, in the vertical dimension, and then the stages of production, the the length of of production, and time wise is in the horizontal dimension. One thing that uh, Roger Garrison liked to add to this diagrammatical exposition is uh, stage-specific labor markets. And the reason for that is because he liked to compare this, this sort of setup to what Keynesians were saying about the macroeconomy. And they're, they're very interested in, in saying what's happening to employment. So here we have a late-stage labor market. 
and an early stage labor market. So on the right hand side, we, we might have a labor market for a retail store. So at Walmart, this could be the supply and demand for retail workers. Notice the price there is a lowercase w for wage and the quantity is a uppercase L for quantity of laborers or number of labor hours. And same in the early stage labor market, this might be for lumberjacks or miners. So labor that is in the earliest uh, stages of production. So let's recap what we have here. We have in the top left, a Hayekian triangle. It's our structure of production. In the top right, we have a trade-off between consumption and investment. And that black line shows our real resource constraint. In the bottom right, we have a loanable funds market or a, a typical credit market. By the way, time markets are visible in two locations here. Uh, so in the bottom right, we have a loanable funds market. But the capital structure also at least gives you the gist of a time market for production. You remember the, the slope of the Hayekian triangle gives you the, the interest rate because capitalists are also engaged in intertemporal exchange. And in the, in the bottom left, we have some stage-specific labor markets. Okay, so let's do an example with all of these elements of sustainable growth. So what does it look like for this economy to lower their rate of time preference and increase savings. So the first step is to increase the supply of loanable funds. We see that this results in a lower equilibrium interest rate, an increase in the funds available and also that are transacted because we move down this demand curve. More people are willing to borrow at this lower interest rate. They're happy to, to borrow the, this, these additional saved funds. This corresponds to a lower level of consumption and increased investment in the top right in the, in the trade-off. Our Hayekian triangle, our structure of production makes this sort of shift. So it gets shorter because we have less consumption going on, but it gets longer. And the, the explanation here is that you'll notice that the, the interest rate fell. So, and the slope of the Hayekian triangle is the interest rate. So what, what entrepreneurs in effect are doing is they see the, these additional saved funds and they're responding appropriately. They're responding in such a way as to say, okay, consumers, you, you have lowered your rate of time preference. You don't want as much con, uh, consumption goods now. You're waiting on more consumption goods in the future. So you decreased your rate of time preference, fine. We'll, we'll start new lines of production that are longer. We'll make new capital goods. We'll make new specific capital goods and make things that won't come to completion until later. And that's exactly what consumers have said when they've increased their savings in the loanable funds market. So it's, it, it matches up quite well. What does this mean for the demand for labor in uh, early and late stages? Well, there's an increase in demand for labor in the early stages and a decrease in demand for labor in the late stages. And this is simply because the, the discounted marginal revenue product of, of the workers in these, different in these different stages has changed. So the discount that you would apply to the workers in these different stages has decreased. And so now there's increased demand in, as you go further back in time uh, to the earlier stage uh, workers. So we see this sort of change, an increase in the wage rates for early stage workers and a decrease um, for the late stage workers. So everything corresponds with what consumers want. Consumers have said, we're gonna increase our savings. We're not gonna consume as much. And entrepreneurs have responded likewise. They said, okay, we'll start new production projects that take longer. And we've already seen the long run results of this. As we increase productivity, if we have more capital goods, if we've expanded our capital stock, we've engaged in new longer lines of production. And the, those new longer lines of production were undertaken because we, the entrepreneurs foresee this increased consumption in the future. So consumers have said that they want that. So there's an expanded set of resources and also the structure of production can expand as well. So this, if you remember a long time ago, I talked about Crusoe. This is what happened to Crusoe. He said, I'm going, not the mushroom example though. I, I'm going to set aside more consumption goods. I'm gonna set aside more coconuts and berries today so that I can pursue a longer production process and produce more capital goods that help me produce more coconuts and berries, for example. And that 
additional productivity that he has by producing the, the capital goods allows him, at least it makes it easier for him to produce even more capital goods. So creating more capital goods makes it easier to make more capital goods. And that's what we see here. We've expanded our set of resources. In the top right diagram, we've, we see the real resource constraint is, is nicer, it's easier. We have more resources to consume and invest. And also the structure of production has expanded. Okay, so let's summarize this in a qualitative way as opposed to a graphical way. So saving involves freeing up resources for production. In credit markets, saved funds are made available to entrepreneurs to purchase factors of production. Entrepreneurs take those funds. The new longer lines of production are started, which is in line with uh, consumer, consumers' time preferences. The additional investment in excess of what is required for the maintaining or replacing of the capital stock pays off with an expanded set of resources in the future. Said another way, this economy experiences sustainable economic growth. So there's nothing here that says that this economy is gonna to have to contract. Like they, there's nothing here that is unsustainable. And if anything, this economic growth paves the way for even more economic growth, sustainable economic growth, because this economy now has more capital goods. Okay, so that's, that's how things can work right. Here, let's now change things up. And let's suppose that there's an increase in the supply of loanable funds that does not originate with the change in consumer's time preferences. So what if we have uh, just this brand new source of funds that does not come from people saying, I'm going to forego consumption today. I'm gonna to forego present consumption so that I could have future consumption. In fact, let's keep people's time preferences the same so that we can isolate the effect of this sort of artificial increase in loanable funds. All right, so just a, a reminder from yesterday when we talked about banking, you'll remember that in both fractional reserve banking without a central bank and in fractional reserve banking with a central bank, it's possible for there to be increases in the supply of credit that don't originate from people saying, I'm gonna increase my saving. So we can have an increase in saving that does not, uh, excuse me, we can have an, an increase in the supply of credit that does not come from people saying, I'm going to relinquish the ability to consume present resources today. And the reason that works is because fractional reserve banks, they take people's deposits and they use that to issue new loans. So the, the loans are, are not coming from savings, they're coming from people's deposits that, that people have, have said that they want to be able to redeem at par on demand. So they haven't said that I'm gonna relinquish present consumption. If anything, they've said, I want to be able to spend this money over the foreseeable future. And we've also seen the example where the central bank decides to purchase government bonds and this expands uh, the, the level of reserves in the fractional reserve banking system, which also serves as a basis for an increase in, in the supply of loans in the economy, notably without a change in time preference, without a change in people saying, I'm going to save more. Okay, so the central bank and or the fractional reserve uh, banking system can expand credit without an economy-wide increase in real saving. Said another way, an economy-wide decrease in the rate of time preference. These newly create, this newly created money enters the economy through credit markets, and so they represent an increase in the supply of loanable funds. Despite the fact that people have not decided to increase their saving, there is an increase in the supply of loanable funds. There are new green pieces of paper or ones and zeros in a bank account that look like saved funds, but it's not real savings. The interest rate falls, but not because of a decrease in the rate of time preference. At the lower interest rate, saving actually decreases. And we'll see that in the graphs in just a moment. Consumption, consumption and borrowing increase. Firms take the new funds and invest in new longer lines of production because they can't, they can't necessarily tell the difference. So they see this increased availability of saved funds. It looks like the new longer lines of production will be profitable. It looks the same from the entrepreneur's perspective. It looks the same as the case where, on, where consumers decided to withhold from consuming today. So factor prices are bid up across the board. Wages increase, employment increases, consumption increases, investment spending increases, and it's just great. It's wonderful. All the numbers are up, uh, stock prices are up, stock indices are up, wages are up. It's a happy party. Until 
So we had this boom. So the reason this can't last, the reason this is an explanation for unsustainable growth is because we didn't actually increase the set of available resources. There was an increase in the amount of money, but there was not new wealth created. There was an increase in the supply of credit, but there, that, that didn't correspond with people's willingness to not consume today. And in fact, people, because of the decrease in the interest rate, people might consume more. In fact, we, we, they do consume more. It's called overconsumption. So consumers did not show that they preferred future output to present output. In fact, they decreased saving at the lower interest rate. The credit expansion does not represent an increase in real resources available for consumption or investment. And the results here are factors of production become increasingly scarce. I like uh, the analogy that I like to use here is it's like a hungry, hungry hippos game for capital goods. So there's only like this fixed set of, of capital goods and entrepreneurs are, you know, just they start uh, tapping on the lever even faster. Uh, because it looks like new longer lines of production are, prof are profitable. So prices are bid up for those uh, capital goods, and they're bid up higher than entrepreneurs expected, which means that the cost of production increase, if it was unexpected, if that increase in cost was unexpected, then they, wouldn't, they would not have pursued those new longer lines of production. And so losses ensue. Those profits that they anticipated uh, turn into losses, and projects are abandoned as a result. And, and this was actually a very prominent feature of the most recent completed boom-bust cycle that we saw. We saw plenty of new housing developments that were totally abandoned, halfway finished houses, halfway finished neighborhoods that just they didn't get finished for a long time. So entrepreneurs were led to believe consumers had saved real resources, had saved, and real resources were available for production. They also were led to believe that longer, more capital-intensive production uh, would be profitable. Okay, so let's look at the, we have time. Let's see what this looks like with Roger Garrison's graphs. So in the bottom right, we have the loanable funds market. There's going to be an increase in the supply of loanable funds, but this increase in the supply of loanable funds is not because of an increase in real savings. It's just the new money that has entered the economy through credit markets. So through the fractional reserve banking system, there's this increase in the supply of loanable funds, but that, that uh, dotted supply curve there is actually still in effect in the form of, of people's time preferences. <clears throat> and we see this, this sort of a bifurcation. We see two points now. So since that existing supply curve represents consumers' time preferences, that, re that shows what they're going to do. So at this new lower interest rate, they're going to decrease the, the quantity of loans that they supply on this market. They're going to increase their consumption and save less. And that's what the, the dot that goes down and to the left signifies. The, the new equilibrium point that's down and to the right signifies the new funds that perhaps businesses and, and some consumers are, are taking because of this increased availability of, of funds. So they are taking the new funds, but savers are actually saving less, which sounds backwards. The difference is made up by the new paper, the new money in this economy. Okay, so what does that mean for this trade-off? This is sort of an interesting uh, thing. So this... The black line, as I said, represents the real resource constraint. So we can only consume and invest a certain amount, but we have an increase in consumption and an increase in investment. So what gives? How do we depict this in this two-dimensional graph here where so many things are happening? So the way Roger Garrison depicts it, and, and I don't know if he fully explained this um, when, when he would give this lecture, is he would show a point that's beyond the PPF. And so some people are like, wait, you can't do that because it's a production possibilities front. It's a trade-off. If you could go beyond it, then where should you actually draw that boundary? It's not really a boundary if you can put a point beyond it. My response is this, there's a, a difference in the real and nominal values now. The, the new money in the economy means that we can increase spending beyond what our real resource constraint would otherwise give us. So we can increase consumption spending and increase investment spending, even though our real resource constraint is what it is. We just, we just the, the numbers don't line up with the real resources at this point. So we have this sort of like virtual, unachievable point beyond where we're, we're spending that much, but it's beyond, we're consuming and investing beyond our, our, our real resource constraint, as we'll see.
Okay, so what does this mean for the Hayekian triangle? For the structure of production, this also goes in two different directions. So you, you sort of see the discoordination here. So you see the, 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 on the consumption and retail end of things, the triangle gets steeper and taller. So there's an increase in consumption. But entrepreneurs are also taking these new funds and they are pursuing new longer lines of production. So there's this, this uh, lengthening of the structure of production at the same time. And you'll notice that the, what suffers, what's not getting attention, is the middle of the, of the structure of production. So, and that's the, that's the point where entrepreneurs will realize that they've made mistakes, perhaps. So, this, so there's the, the structure of production is really going in two different directions. We've got consumers pulling it one direction and producers pulling it in the, in the other direction. But like I said, it's a party, so wages are up and everybody's happy. So for, on both the retail end and also the lumberjacks and miners, they've got an increase in their pay. So there's an increase in wages across the board. And this, this sort of shows us what's happening in factor markets in general. So capital goods prices are increasing as consumers are uh, making retail shops more profitable. Uh, the entrepreneurs who are taking the these, new, these newly available funds, they're also increasing the wages and prices that they pay for factors of production. So incomes across the board are increasing. However, it can't last. And the reason it, the reason it can't last is because we didn't actually have a, a real restructuring of the, of the structure of production, or at least we didn't have a restructuring of the structure of production that was in line with people's time preferences. What we had was Crusoe hallucinated, and he thought he had this, uh, this available set of resources, but he, it, it was false. So on all of the, the lines of production that entrepreneurs pursued, all these new longer lines, they'll turn out to be unprofitable. So the capital goods don't actually exist. They thought that there would be capital goods available for them to complete these projects, but, but there is an increasing scarcity. They'll realize that the resources that they need to complete their projects aren't actually there. And so that means that those, those prices will increase. Consumers are the ones who have final say over where real resources are going now. And so there was actually consumption of our total set of resources in the economy. Consumption increased. Saving, saving decreased, real saving decreased. So that we actually, we might have actually eaten into our capital stock as, a, as opposed to, to bolstered it or increased it. <clears throat> so the, the economy shrinks, we have our bust. So what does the bust look like? Firms attempt to liquidate the malinvested capital. So they made all these mistakes, they're, they're gonna have to fix the mistakes, they're gonna have to uh, liquidate. They're going to have to, you know, fetch the or get the best price that they can for the capital goods that uh, they invested in. Wages decrease and workers are laid off. So we see a decrease in demand for workers across the board. Credit markets dry up. So as as consumers impose their real time preferences, it, it becomes more difficult to to get loans. Credit markets dry up. Prices readjust to reflect uh, consumer demands, which is it's a very good thing. So that's what we needed all along. So we made mistakes during the boom phase where we, we were allowing factor prices especially to not reflect consumer demands. So the bus is a recovery phase as people try to find profitable uses for land, labor, and capital. So we, we made the wrong sorts of capital goods. We pursued the wrong lines of production. We pursued lines of production that were longer than what consumers actually wanted and the real resources for those new lines of production didn't actually exist. So everything comes to a halt and we have to, we have to make do with what we actually have. Just like Crusoe, once, once he realizes his actual set of resources, he has to make do with what he actually has and, and make changes that way. So what are the lessons learned? Um, if you just look at the highly aggregated data, so if you just look at, um, the data that you can find at the Federal Reserve Economic Data website, then you're not gonna see the real problem. You're not gonna see the changes in the structure of production. So the errors were in the structure of production. The errors were, were malinvestment. We, we produced the wrong capital goods. But if you're looking at total investment spending or really just 
total spending in the economy, you're not, you're not going to see that problem. You're going to mi misdiagnose the problem, and you're also probably going to give bad solutions. Be if you misdiagnose the problem and you see that, oh, all of a sudden there's this big decrease in spending, the solution is more spending, right? That's, that's the sort of problems that arise when you just look at highly aggregated data. Another lesson that we've learned is that to, to properly analyze uh, a hampered market economy, you have to at least have a, a good understanding of how the unhampered market economy functions. So we looked at an example of sustainable economic growth before we looked at the unsustainable. And, and that way we were able to contrast the two. And this goes back to a, a maxim by Hyde where he said, uh, before we can meaningfully ask what might go wrong, we should first understand how things could ever go right. Finally, we saw how sustainable production, sustainable economic growth is based on a real reallocation of resources away from consumption. So we have to have real savings first. That's the prescription. That's what we really need to have sustainable economic growth. And we saw how unsustainable booms are caused by artificial increases in credit. So where we confuse entrepreneurs about the real availability of resources. We also saw how recessions are the time when we fix the mistakes of the past. So a lot of policies are directed at quelling the recession or about you know, like not making the recession so bad or like just trying to increase spending during the recession. And all of these government interventions that are instituted during the recession phase actually work to our detriment. They actually make it more difficult for us to find the profitable uses of factors of production uh, in our very complex capital structure. So I've run out of time. Once again, I've got a recommended reading slide. You can snap a picture. Thank you.